right, everybody, welcome back to the Canadian Rec. This is Jamie Gray coming to you from Ross St. New Brunswick here in the east coast of Canada. Had uh, some great weather over the last night. It got majorly cold, but a lot of rain, no snow, which was nice. So uh, hopefully that can stay away and we get back on the pitch soon. Anyway, uh, let's lead right into it. We got uh, Henry Paul, uh, the Canadian Rec welcomes Henry Paul. Henry is current coach of men's seven program, former assistant of the 15s. He's got 23 caps for the New Zealand Kiwis in league rugby. Then he moved on to play some union in England, where he had six matches with uh, England during the Six Nations. He also had a stellar sevens career with England, 02 and 06 Commonwealth Games, one U.S. tourney in 06. And he also won the Hong Kong tourney to, uh, 2002, where he's named player of the tournament. So it's pretty cool. He's a uh, jack of all trades, well-rounded in all things rugby. Great conversation uh, coming up with Henry, so stick with us here. Just a quick plug, you know where we are. We're on the Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We've got those three social media places uh, highlighted. So just Google us, what have you, well, you'll find us. Or check us out on, uh, send us an email at thecanadianrocketgmail.com if you have anything you want to talk about. Uh, listen, if, you, if you're listening, actually, make sure that you're following. Make sure you're subscribing. Make sure you're sharing these messages. We're on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and CastBox. And lastly, if you're not sure where to go, if you want to get our message to somebody else uh, and they want to look at some past pods or you do, uh, check out our website, thecanadianrock.weebly.com. And that's where everything is hosted for you to check links, check swag, check past guests, check content, etc., cetera, et cetera. What's going on in the world of rugby right now? We're going to keep a brief. A couple things. International front. Uh, Lions are back on. I think everybody's heard this has been a, a few days out now. It's actually going to go full tilt in South Africa. Well, a very hard hit nation by COVID, but their uh, plans are evolving that they will be going and that uh, their hope is that uh, I guess they're going to have fans in the stands. We'll see how that goes. Um, I, you know, I've given my thoughts and feelings on the Lions tour. I do enjoy it's great rugby, but I also think there's a missed opportunity by a lot of other nations during that Lions tour window. And it's, uh, it'll be interesting, but it's going to be fun to watch if it does go ahead. We're going to get to that in a little bit. It's going to be a little bit topic of discussion in the gray area. On the local front uh, slash international, both our sevens programs are currently in Dubai at the moment. This is pretty cool. So Henry, our guest, our, our guest today, he's actually in Dubai with the men's program. Uh, I've chatted with a couple of girls that are over there uh, getting prepped to play. And it's going to be, uh, they're, they're, they're actually getting some good games in and they're going to have some good quality prep time going into the seventh circuit. And this is uh, something that usually uh, doesn't, happen very often where they actually get to go to Dubai on the same footing as everybody else because everybody else is in the same footing where they really haven't had any games so this is going to be this is going to be exciting uh that's we're going to keep a brief for the news but we're going to chalk up chalk up some gray area stuff here as I said Lions are on but the Women's Rugby World Cup 21 is off is this business ahead of player welfare or is World Rugby and New Zealand Rugby Union is it too soft? Is that that's probably the incorrect term? But I just I feel saddened by all the women that aren't going to be able to play and represent their countries at the the World Cup this year, and uh, they're saddened that it's been postponed by another year. And I know you know I chatted with Leslie McKenzie a little bit, a previous guest, and she said you know we're looking at we have another year to prep, and uh, you know a few of the few of the national women here in Canada said the same thing. But at the same time, it is it is a disheartening moment when it's get pushed off. And then couple that with a couple weeks later, Lions Tour being put on and going full force. New Zealand has been one of the knock on wood safest countries in the world when it comes to COVID. And South Africa has been one of the hardest hit countries with COVID. Yet Lions Tour is going to happen in South Africa. Is it just a money grab for those nations involved? I, I know they say that South Africa rugby union is hurting financially and England rugby is hurting financially, la, la, la. Uh, you know, cry me a river. I'm not trying to be insensitive, but Canada rugby is hurting financially. USA rugby is hurting financially. There's a lot of nations that are hurting financially. Is this good for the game? Is this good for player welfare that this is actually going to go ahead and happen? I don't know the answer. I hope and pray that the Lions tour goes off without any hitches and that nobody gets sick and that nobody gets uh, COVID during this. I'm, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen, but that is my hope is that if you're going to push forward with this and you're going to risk players and management and coaches and trainers and fans and put them potentially at risk, I hope 
that everything is, uh, there's COVID guidelines that are followed to a T and everybody stays safe and COVID free. Anyway, that's the gray area. I might chalk some, uh, throw something up on social media throughout the week and get your thoughts as well. But right now we're going to stick around because we have Henry Paul coming up and you're not going to want to miss our conversation with Henry. All right, so the Canadian Rock would like to welcome Henry Paul. Henry's the uh, coach of Team Canada Sevens, the men's program, doing some exciting thing there with the lads. Henry, welcome to the Canadian Rock. No, thanks for having me. All right, so let's jump in. When I was reading your CV, this is impressive. So born and raised in New Zealand. Uh, you mentioned before we recorded that you kind of moved away at 18. You went to England, Russia, Dubai, and now you're in Canada. You played rugby union, rugby league, sevens, everything. Just you name it, you did it. Can you talk to us about some of those playing experiences? I mean, it's very broad, but is there anything that really stands out to you from your playing days? I'd tell you what, you know, like funnily enough, uh, coming to, and now we're based in uh, Victoria here on the island. Um, I came here when I was 16 playing softball. It was actually my favorite sport. I, I was living in Auckland. Uh, we had a chance to come on tour and we came, we came to Canada of all places. It was a you know, trip of a lifetime for a 16 year old um, playing what you know, we called in New Zealand softball, uh, fast pitch. Um, so I've got you know, great memories when I came back to uh, work with Kingsley in the, in the national uh, men's 15s in their preparation for the ripper charge, you know, uh, leading up to the Rugby World Cup in Tokyo in Japan. So, you know, my, my, my sports story's been pretty varied and, and a bit wild and being, you know, here, there and everywhere. Um, I was just really lucky. I, you know, I had really um, a, a great, you know, parents that, you know, really put a lot back into me and my brother. And I think, I, I you know, I, although I take the mickey out of my brother a lot, I think he had a big part in, in helping me uh, become the athlete because uh, we were like typical brothers at each other's throats all the time, always getting told off by mum and dad. But you know, having a brother, you know, similar age, couple of years difference between me and Robbie, um, I definitely made him the international player he was. I, I, I tried to take credit and, and become his agent and all that sort of jazz. Uh, I said it was basically because of me that he got to England himself and became a you know, full international and a professional rugby league player. <laughs> well, I definitely think he, he helped me, you know, and as all brothers do, in sort of moulding you. Um, and mum and dad were obviously a big part, you know, played a huge part because they were the gear stewards pretty much all our life of, of the rugby club and the softball club. Um, so we were able to, you know, be down and have all the equipment as kids. Um, I, you know, I read a lot at the moment, you know, you know, I read Outliers, you know, and you, by Malcolm Gladwell, and you think of that age group, you know, I, I, I was a January or February baby, uh, so maybe had a head start on my peers, um, so I always got to play in those, you know, I got that six-month jump on on some of my teammates and, 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 and um, buddies growing up. Um, yeah, I think it's just one of those, uh, I was one of, luckily enough, one of those, those kids that had a really um, supportive upbringing um, and, and, and helped having a brother that was a pretty, pretty natural athlete as well. Uh, probably quicker than me, I'll give him that. Um, <laughs> so I was always chasing him around. And yeah, I think, you know, really when you, you, you're playing in those age groups, playing different multi-sport, uh, just loving it as a kid, um, didn't really think that, you know, would rugby or rugby league would take me into a career, but... Um, you know, you, you find out when I eventually got to that age where, oh, wow, I can actually make money from this. Then I learned pretty quickly uh, that actually money and sport and love, then it also becomes business. Mm -hmm. so I, I signed as a young uh, academy player for the New Zealand Warriors that are in the, what they call now the NRL in Australia. Um, I was one of the first batch of, of junior kids that signed. Uh, but I learned pretty quickly that uh, signing those contracts doesn't really really mean the paper it's written on because um, I had a bit of I had a bit of drama and, I, and there was things that went on behind the scenes and it all became pretty ugly and I, I learned we were, from a young age you know you got to kind of when it comes down to business you look after yourself you um, you get the right people involved uh, became a bit bigger than you know just mum and dad at their advice I needed actual how I got out of the New Zealand Warriors and ended up in England with, with Wigan. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a unique story and fascinating memory for me to think back on. Is that something you can dive into? Like, you would have been relatively young at that point, right? 
that was yeah, it's a long story but basically if i can try and sum it up really quickly um i was an age group uh, i was my age group captain uh for new zealand went on tour to england we had uh i think it was a 12 match tour of the uk at that time the current uh island coach uh andrew farrell was playing for um gb academy at that stage so we had a test match against um Faz. i couldn't you know obviously yep. not because i played with him um he then made the full international team um, and we had a second miss. We, we played at uh, Wembley uh, as a pre-match between the full international New Zealand men's and, and Great Britain. On that tour, I ended up staying and playing for a local club. Um, instead of coming back to New Zealand and playing local rugby, I, I, was, I had the chance to play full British, uh, not Super League, they didn't call it Super League at that time, but uh, pretty much the English Premiership. So I got to get, play against the big clubs, Leeds, Wigan, um, Warrington. There were, there were loads of internationals, in, English, Australian, um, New Zealand. They were playing, you know, and I was an 18-year-old kid. Um, so, I, you know, I, I took that with, you know, I saw dollar signs, I think, it was the real story, you know. <laughs> um, at that time, I think there was a the New Zealand dollar was worth $3, $3 to every pound. Um, and... If we if we won a game, this is you know quite funny. I was I was you know I was basically at, at high school going into uni, and the club said to me that the Wakefield was the club Wakefield Trinity said, uh, "Look, we'll, we'll give you we'll give you two hundred pounds if you win a game." And I, I equated that to six hundred New Zealand dollars. And as a as a as a student, and and a kid working at the warehouse just packing shelves, I was like, "Oh my, oh wow! Like, oh my god, I'm going to get that that much money." Didn't realize. That they'd only won two previous eighteen games. That only won two games, so the actual match winning fee probably wasn't going to happen. But I, you know, I initially you just see dollar signs. So mm. I stayed for those four months. They they were in a relegation zone, uh, but we had some really good wins, and I, I gained a lot of experience. And one of the wins was a Wednesday night in Wigan, and at that time Wigan had just become were just on the road of becoming world club champions that were going to play Brisbane Broncos in a, in a Great Britain versus Australia. Um, and so they were the premier club, but we beat them Wakefield, you know, lowly Wakefield. And I, you know, just lucky got on the end of a couple of tries that night, which, which meant that Wigan were pretty keen to sign me. I'd already signed for Auckland. So I got in a bit of a, a bit of a wrestle match with Wigan and Auckland. Um, I wasn't going to be allowed out of that contract. And it was a contract basically for a t-shirt and a tracksuit. Mm -hmm. And that was fine because I had signed it. And, and that's what you do. You, you, you own up to your word. And I, you know, I said, I asked Auckland if I could leave. Um, Cause I just, you know, as a kid growing up in Auckland, I, there's the only thing I ever wanted to do was play for Auckland. But that team that Auckland picked when John Money, the coach came in, he went around the world and went, I want the world's number one halfback, the world's number one fullback prop. But as you do, as you build a, a good squad. Right. But all us young, good, what I were thinking, the next generation kids, um, I didn't really see a spot, a place for us. So I'd just come from England playing full premiership against loads of internationals. And now I want one of the premier teams wants you to come back to Auckland to go back into reserve grade and, and academy. I kind of wanted more, you know, mm. as you do, as you get a taste of it, you want more. So I asked to leave. They said no. The businessman, my agent, I then got an agent. He started negotiating and, and I got out of Auckland. And then that was my, yeah, that was my journey. I, I was now playing for Wigan Premier Club and I was in, in the British game. So, um, yeah, it was just, just a kind of strange, weird time. And then I ended up, you know, moving moving from mum and dad's so I, I did a year at uh, teacher's training college I was, I was going to be a teacher and that's I, a noble profession very very noble <laughs> but my first section I don't know if they how they do it here in Canada but my first section was a primary school in New Zealand Ouch. And, and it was a week's a week section uh, but you know sort of um, following mirroring shadowing uh, the, the, the teacher yeah and and it wasn't a great start because my first week was um, changing a few kids. Um, you know, they had accidents at yeah. school and I had to, you know, as you do as an adult, uh, clean up after the kids and then sing uh, the wheels on the bus go round and round. Um, 
take them for walks to count beads out on the, it just wasn't the uh, kind of the life I wanted to live right then as a, you know, a 19, 20 yeah. year old. Um, and, and I had this contract on the side that, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll defer my teaching uh, right <laughs> now and I'll come back to it. And that was my intention. Yeah. I, you know, I was 17 years. I, I, I played rugby league and rugby union uh, professionally, so I never went back to teaching. But, um, but yeah, it was, yeah it, was a, it was a vacation. That, you know, yeah, I mean, New Zealand was, was cool. I had a bunch of my friends that went there and now are principals, vice principals. You know, we, we share some really good stories. And, and a bunch of those guys came to the UK and did their OE and, you know, spent time with me up in Yorkshire and um, you know, great, great times, great friends. That's awesome. It, when you, when you spoke about your, your playing time there, uh, it's interesting. Like you, you, when I hear you talk, you sound like you were raised in a Canadian culture, but with the rugby background, it's when you tie those two together, how humble you are, you deflect, deflected all your praise you know, to your parents and to your, you know, to your upbringing and how things went. You didn't actually talk about yourself, which I, it's one of those things that always astounds me about rugby players is that, you know, there's, whether it's league, whether, you know, there's 12 other guys or there, it's 15s and there's 14 other guys on the pitch. You're only as good as what you can help your teammates become and how they become good. And I think in a roundabout way, that's basically what you just talked about. And I think that was really, really elegant how you said that. But getting through all that, you also, you had this really interesting time in England where you, you actually played some Six Nations matches with them, which is happening right now. And you had a pretty stellar sevens career with them as well. At the Commonwealth Games a couple of times, you were named player of the tournament back in 02 uh, in Hong Kong, uh, won the US tourney in 06. Like all of that has, when I saw that, uh, that, that really struck me is that, man, this guy is a very well-rounded rugby player, 15s, league sevens. How how do you, how were you able to switch codes and in, in, in so not frequently but how were you able to switch codes and be such a leave such a good impact on the pitch every time you were playing in a different code? I'll be honest. I think uh, you might think that I'm again just trying to deflect to other people. But I, I I was really lucky. I played in some really good squads. Right. <laughs> I, I had this uh, I had this ten year period where I went to Wigan. We had. You name it, we had it. Jason Robinson, Andrew Farrell, Sean Edwards, uh, Martin of Fire, Inga Tuigamala, uh, Dennis Bear, like the cream of the crop were at Wigan. And then the next generation there, um, guys you might know, know, not know of, and, and people probably in Canada know the names of rugby league, but in, in rugby league terms, um, Simon Horton and Chris Radlinski, guys at Wigan, there's a bunch of guys, and I don't mean to disrespect, I could just be here all day really off names. Um, but they were the, the next generation coming through at Wigan as well. So I was really lucky, you know, I joined a great team with a um, smart uh, back office that brought in really good young players to keep that, that winning tradition going. Then I left them um, to join my brother at Bradford. And at that time, the, the coach there and the group of, uh, you know, owner and, and uh, management did exactly the same thing. They started and thought, how are we going to put a championship team together? And, you know, ask me if I would join and be part of that, that team. And I, I joined that team and they had a bunch of guys I could reel off again where but they end up becoming top internationals. So you're playing in a team that's full of internationals. You better be good or you're not going to last very long, right? <laughs> so as a team, we were really good. And, you know, I played in a position that I could, you know, off the back of some of the big carries and good offloads. Yeah, I picked up some points and, uh, you know, I prided myself as a goal kicker. So... Uh, that helped me get it. You know, I always thought that it's, a, it's a string to my bow. Get in the get in the team. Kickers get in the team. So, you know, work hard at that. Stay after training. Do extras. Get there early. Do extras. You know, I prided myself on on having good consistency. Um, so, I was really lucky in that respect to 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 have to join those two teams just when they were you know at the peak and 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 bringing good young kids through. Joined four. I was four years at Bradford. Three years of Bradford, sorry. Um, again, with the top players in the country, and we were in finals, and we won some, we lost some, and then I don't know. I just thought it had such a good ride, you know, nine years in, in British Rugby League that uh, I, I was part of a Wigan squad that were allowed um, and Rugby Union gone professional. 
we, we went down to the middle six sevens as a rugby league team. There's the first rugby league team and it's an invited team with those players that I mentioned. And, you know, we, we cruised, you know, with, there were moments in games where we struggled because we were different. We didn't know breakdown. We didn't know, you know, some of the nuances in rugby, but we could just catch and pass and run, right? So we went to the middle six sevens and, yeah, the, we won that tournament and it kind of opened people's eyes to rugby league. And it's a really northern sport in England or rugby union, kind of predominantly southern sport. And, and that opened eyes and that, that really then from that one tournament, the rugby union clubs now being professional, why not go after rugby league players as, you know, as athletes and as part of his making up squads? So myself, Jason Robinson went to Bath Rugby Union uh, for, for four months. Uh, my brother and Gary Conley uh, went to Harlequins and Inga Tui Gamala. I think Inga Tui actually played with the Gareth Rees at Wasps cool. for four months. And then that was kind of the start of like guys from the league going to Union. Um, really, it was up in the Northern Hemisphere that really started, obviously, because Union went professional. So um, I, was, I was lucky I, I joined, you know, because before then, rugby league guys in rugby union, whenever rugby, because I played with Scott Quinnell at Wigan, he came from uh, from Welsh Rugby Union, and that was kind of like, that was looked on at the time as like, he's broken, he's broken the Holy Grail, you know, because obviously his family, the Quinnell family were huge in rugby union in Wales. But Scott had a young family and he, you know, he wanted to make a career and to support their family in, in a way that he wanted to not how other people wanted to shape his life. So he came and, and got a great contract at Wigan. He was fantastic. If Rugby Union hadn't gone professional, Scott would have been one of the world's best forwards in rugby rugby league. He was, you know, obviously six foot four and could run like the wind. So he was great for us at Wigan. Uh, but but Union went professional. So maybe they saw the tide and uh, Scott went back to Rugby Union. Um uh, and then Wigan missed out on you know, a fantastic forward. But, yeah, I was just fascinated. I played with a bunch of guys that had come from union to league, and then I was going from league to union. And then, obviously, myself having a British background. Uh, my grandfather was born in Liverpool, um, and that's how I qualified, you know, to play uh, for England on Ancestry. Um, and when I, went, when, when, I, when I made the decision, personal decision, to go and, and give rugby... Um, give rugby union a, a proper crack, not four months, you know, go and, and give it a real, you know, have a, have a, see what it's like, you know. I'd grown up in New Zealand, obviously playing it as a kid. Um, but I just found as a, as, a, as, a, as a kid, I didn't get much ball. You know, I was chasing the pack a lot, you know, as you, as you do in, you know, sort of age group rugby. And if you persevere, you get, you get to what you want to do. But league... You know, I touched the ball 20 times. I make 20 tackles in league. You know, I just, it's just a game that I, I wanted to play at that, that, at that age. Right. Um, and I wanted the involvements. But when I got a bit older and they were changing the game, you know, Union was going through a bunch of you know, changes. It became less kick and clap, was what they used to call it, to, you know, let's go and play and, you know, and try things out, you know, be innovative. And you know, I, I, I joined a Gloucester club when I went, when I switched to Rugby Union. I joined a club. I did my homework, you know, looked at the coaching staff, looked at the players there. They had a bunch of guys from down under, um, you know, and straight away from day one at Gloucester, you know, playing with Terry Funaloa, uh, yeah. Robert Todd, some guys you might not have heard of, but uh, they, they were all on the same page. We wanted to throw the ball around and run. Um, Andy Gomesall had joined us from uh, Wasps and Harlequins. Uh, James, a couple of young wingers, James Simpson, Daniel, Marcel Garvey, French fly half, who was a Jouet, so it was great. I, I you know, I, I, uh, I, I loved it that, that those four years, and then so then I joined the Gloucester team that had a bunch of England internationals. We we were up there thereabouts, you know, winning most of our games. So I just got this this really lucky, you know, luck or hard work, you know, sort of twelve year period of just playing in you know big games, lots of finals. Um, and it was, yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. That sounds really cool. That's a real interesting journey. And the way your playing career went is kind of how your, your, your coaching career has gone. Like you, you seem like you, you want to learn about as much of the game as you can in, in different areas. You, you were with Russia at the Churchill cup 
uh, you're at rugby world cups with Kingsley, uh, followed, you know, you were in Russia with the sevens program, you were in Dubai. Now you're in Canada, you're running the sevens program. What can all those experiences that you've accomplished, you know, you've accumulated over the last 10 to 12 years, how are, how are they helping you as a coach for Canada? Um, well, I mean, it's obviously given me, you know, a, a lot of experiences. I mean, my coaching pathway uh, started with uh, Steve Diamond in Russia. Um, and, you know, you, like, any, you, like any job, you need, you need a break. Um, I was a young coach with, with him, uh, you know, come off the back of a long career. Um, so, you know, I was learning that side of the game. Um, I'd always coached. Um, as a player, you know, you go and help out midweek at, uh, you know, your friends. Um, we were always at camps. Um, so I was, I was hopefully able to um, transition my, my knowledge to juniors, to second team players, to some first team players. But yeah, it's a different, it's a different beast when you're in it every day as a coach. Uh, and especially for internationals, um, you do, you have less time with, you know, if you're in a daily environment, mm-hmm. um, like I am now with the with these guys, but my first initial coaching experience um, professionally with, with Russia was the Churchill Cup in the States, um, and you, we've only really what you know you've got very short amount of time to turn things around and, and, and imprint your blueprint on them. Um, so we try to keep it really simple. And then I think a really good initial coaching lesson with the Russians was keep things simple not overload them with too much uh, information. Um, there's a, there was a language barrier, although we had, a, you know, I, I found out later they could all speak perfect English, but they, you know, to take the mickey out of me, they're like, oh, no, I no understand. But in my view, I understand. So um, I had to kind of, you know, sometimes did the old, you know, do you understand me? And then, and then do it like the right, do, you and try and speak like Russian and English, like that weird thing that people do. Learn really quickly. You know, you have that silly art to me of the, the, the sort of uh, brought up in Ireland, went to Black Rock School. He was great. He was like, HP, they, they actually, all the boys, pretty good English, um, just speak normal. Um, and then, so yeah, you try and keep the messages short and sharp, direct. I mean, I love that, that World Cup, that, that ENC that I, I joined with Russia, with Steve. Uh, we learned a lot there and then we went to the World Cup and I was a tap coach at that time and uh, we, we, I just you know we, we scored some beauties that that, that that tournament against Ireland we scored more tries against Australia like we scored three tries against Australia in our pool game and not even Ireland and you know and I you know talking to Phil Blake the defensive coach for Ireland and Robbie Deans after that game um, yeah, they, 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 you know, there, there was their kind of team that they were giving a bunch of guys, you know, run out. Obviously, you know, respect to them. They, you know, they're playing Russia. But, you know, as an as attack coach, when you're scoring tries from halfway, you know, set piece moves that we'd worked on, it's, it's a nice feeling. Um, you yeah, know, we got hammered, you know, but we gave the US, you know, our first game was the US and Taranaki. And uh, if we were going to win the game and we were trying to be the first team going to a first World Cup, to win our game, uh, you know, and our, that Russian team that we had could play in dry weather. We could play. We like to throw the ball around. We just happened to turn up typical Taranaki. Turns up that night. It's a howling, galing, you know, the wind it was, you know, the rain's coming horizontal, um, and we lost thirteen wow. eight. But hell of a hell of a defensive stand from the boys. Uh, that was a good experience. I played with Mike McDonald, the prop, the USA prop. Played with him at Leeds. So, you know, I knew a lot about that USA team and uh, fair play to, to them. They beat us that night. Um, and then we went through the tournament, just say, let's go there and enjoy it. Let's attack. Let's, let's got nothing to lose, everything to gain. Take these memories back to Russia. Um, so, yeah, like, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't look at what, you know, how my journey here to Canada after that experience, um, working with Kingsley with, with the Russians. Um, and then, Sort of going on my own journey back to the UK, working in a school, uh, being a director of rugby at a school, you know, looking at that side of it, first 15 rugby as well, um, and then and then premiership or first team rugby uh, at a, a national three side, um, doing sort of juggling everything. That, that gave me a lot of experience as well, looking at admin side of things. 
Um, and then I went to Dubai, as you said, uh, was a rugby academy there, coaching a the first team there. Um, again, traveling, a bit of travel overseas. Um, and then, yeah, I then getting asked by Kingsley to come and help and look at the defensive side of things for the, the team, the national 15s team, as they build up to um, the Rugby World Cup in, in Tokyo. Um, yeah, just really varied, varied experience and background. Um, but coming on with the sevens, you know, I'd taken the Russian national sevens team on the World Series for a short stint there. Uh, we had done, a, uh, we'd done the Hong Kong sevens. We went up to Japan. I then did London and uh, Glasgow with the Russian team and then had them in the European series. So, you know, coaching sevens is not new to me. Um, I'm really fortunate because this team can play. These guys yeah. are good. They're man for man. Uh, I, I would, I, like I've said to a bunch of people, I would put us up against any team. And they've obviously, they've proved themselves uh, under Damien uh, at Singapore in the 2016-2017 um, season that, you know, they can win the big one. Um, you know, what we're working on is a bit of consistency. And I think this, this year, you know, coming in, when I came in, um, we looked at some other things and doing things a little bit different because everyone's got their, their different way. No, no one way is the perfect way. It's, it's how, um, you know, we can react uh, together. You know, I always I think of myself as a collaborative coach. But I'm, you know, I feel blessed that, you know, that I've been able to coach Nathan Hariyama, Pat Kay, you know, Harry Jones, Connor Bray, Matt Mullins, uh, Cooper Coates, uh, Jake Teal, um, you know, <laughs> Dave Richard, even these young kids, Dave Richard, Brock Webster, Guys that Canadian rugby might not be too too aware of, but there's some young, great young kids coming through, you know, and being well led by the guys in front of them. Um, Isaac Kay, um, oh yeah, like I don't want to be disrespectful any of my my team. Um, I rate them all highly, um, and you know we're we're trying to figure out what our game looks like going into the Olympics, and it's just a just a shame because of the pandemic that. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a chance to really build on, you know, our, you know, I thought the season, you know, we started, and it was a different season this year, um, you know, with less games because of um, because of the packed nature of the the program, uh, introducing the, the women's competition. Uh, we were only able to, if we didn't make those quarterfinals uh, in terms of the men, because they had 16 teams, um, you were only really given that one game on the day two. So, you know, we had to really do a job and try and get into into quarterfinals really to get more games and you know I think one of the issues we have in North America you tell me um, trying to get some some pre-season or pre-world series competitions being up right up here in Canada it's hard to get hard to get that pre-world series events in I know and down in Southern Hemisphere they have this Oceania tournament and then they rock into Dubai and Cape Town um, and I know it's been a, it's been a Talking to all the guys and all the, all the team, they've always found it difficult. They've always struggled at, in Dubai and Cape Town, not being able to get that collision contact competition in pre those tournaments. So it was something we tried to work on. Uh, we didn't get it totally right, and we're looking at different parts of our game. But I really liked how we had a bit of a progression through the season. Obviously, fifth in Hamilton after Dubai and Cape Town. Uh, a little bit underperformed in, in Sydney to miss out on getting the quarterfinals there. But then LA, um, again, you know, one or two tweaks and one or two tries go the other way, you're in the quarterfinals. But fair play to Ireland, you know, going in and beating South Africa in, in LA uh, for them to get into the quarterfinals. And then, and then obviously Vancouver, you know, only our, only our sixth tournament together, really. Um, and the boys winning, you know, first time they've beaten South Africa for what was it eight years? Um, and we just, we looked we looked in control. There was there were times in that tournament against Fiji, uh, against South Africa that we actually you know well we did we looked in control of those games. It wasn't luck. It wasn't the bounce of the ball. I don't think it was you know, really structured um, and something that we process that we've been working on and something we can really get our teeth into. So. It was just a shame, we, you know, we were looking, really looking forward to Hong Kong and Singapore and obviously to finish and see, see how, what our game was like in London and Paris and, you know, the, you know, the bunch of things, when, you know, with, with the pandemic and, you 
know, we're a lot, of, lot more people had it worse off than us. So, you know, we've got nothing to complain about. We're not complaining. It's just in terms of our sport and the way we were going in our game, would have liked to have been able to finish off and see where we, how we could have finished off there. Yeah, I think yeah, you guys, I think from what I saw, you've, I think you were eighth overall in 2020. You talked about there some the direction, like you're really just fine-tuning the consistency of the team. Uh, you've got some great athletes, some great rugby players there that are all pulling for each other. It, I mean, it was just announced today that the Rugby World Cup for the women has been officially postponed to 2022. What are you guys looking at in Olympic preparation? Like, uh, you know, there, there's been talks that they might not go on, but there's still a lot of talks that, no, the Olympics are still happening. How are you keeping the guys prepared for that? And I, I guess tuning out some of the media, like what's what's your role as the coach in that aspect of things? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we, I think going back about six, seven weeks, there was a, it was a, a, an article in the news about the Olympics being canceled. I think it was um, some, uh, someone in the media, so someone dropped some information that they in, in Tokyo, who knows what's going on? Like, we're, we're not there on the ground. So they could diff, they, they, then they should be having discussions about if it's cancelled, what do we do? That's things they can control. Uh, so there was something that was, there was a, uh, a leak of a post, and then obviously the, it got put out onto the world news, world media, and then, you know, the, some of the players are reaching out, HP, it's cancelled. And I'm like, look, guys, we can only control what we can control. And that's our environment. And that's, that's you know, you go, because the guys work, you know, they're this, you know, you don't get a lot of money playing rugby for, for Rugby Canada Sevens. Um, you know, they're living on, uh, so, you know, really, you know, we're really generous stipend from the Olympic Fund, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a lot to live on and, and, and create a career on. So guys are trying to balance work and it's a lot of Olympic athletes. You know, so um, if, if we all realize that the commitment they've shown over the last five years, you know, because they missed out on Rio and a bunch of those guys really wanted to make the Olympics. So, you know, they, they kind of put other life on pause to stay in the centralized environment, to, 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 to train all, all the time, you, you know, pretty much four or five times a week so that they can get, be in this moment and try and get themselves into, you know, a, a good, condi good con great condition and tactically aware um, but it's tough, and you know. So when they when that first item news item was dropped, I said, "Look, I'll, I'll reach out uh, and fight and try and figure out." But no one really knows. It's a tough time. So you know, if it is cancelled, then it is cancelled. There's nothing, and not you guys have shown so nothing you can do to change what's going on in, in, a, in a virus, right? That wasn't started by any by you guys, right? So um, and then yeah, and then we kind of. I think, you know, there's a lot of senior guys in the team that have been around seen a bit and they were kind of like, yeah, look, that's, you know, everyone's right. You know, we can't control it. Um, what we can control is getting to training early, giving a good hit out, getting home, getting our, you know, food and getting that balance right, getting our sleep right, looking after our friends and family. And everyone's been, you know, everyone's been great. I, you know, I can't fault anyone for the commitment and, and you know, the, the sanity because of you know we've had this year we would have we were supposed to play a tournament um, we would have had you know Dubai and Cape Town last November December we would have been in you know in, in, in the information that was passed to us at the end of last year we, we, everyone was hoping that we would be out of this by now mm -hmm. so then they had to cancel in New Zealand and Sydney and they had to cancel you know Hong Kong and Singapore um, LA and, and Vancouver has been moved. Um, and, and obviously, uh, well, LA, yeah. So yeah, so everything's been cancelled. Uh, we now have to try and find ways to uh, play games regionally. So you know, for us, hopefully, get some games in against the US and Argentina. I mean, the USA and Argentina went to play in a tournament in Spain um, the end of February. So literally a couple of weeks ago, um, there was some some good. By the sounds of it, some. Um, some good rugby sevens played out there. Some tough sevens. I think Kenya were there as well, which were obviously Spain. Um, so you know, I, you know I, I'm, we're all a bit jealous of them playing in those tournaments. But it, it would have hurt our program if we tried to go there and try and come back and spend 14 days in, yeah. in quarantine. And we 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 had we obviously had a, a break, 
over Christmas. So we wouldn't have been, I think, physically ready for that tournament. Um, so we're hoping to get something else in April and May. Uh, but at the moment, yeah, we, we're in our daily training environment. We're trying to um, progress our, you know, our standards. And, and really now we're looking at um, some sort of contact and collision because uh, we're in an elite environment. The guys, you know, we've got a lot of policies and procedures in place to make sure everyone's safe. And when we did come back, we came back around June time of last year when obviously everyone was in a three, three month sort of lockdown. Uh, we started off slowly. We had see that our medical staff and, and, and administration were, you know, very, very strict in our and how and what we did to come back. Um, we started off with just sort of ball handling drills, and then which now slowly progressed that into we, we can be full contact in, in our environment, um, but we obviously got to keep our bubbles small, and we're. You know, because we, we have an academy here as well in, in our training environment and we have the women's team, 15s and 7s. So we all have to be kind of slotted in, kept, you know, apart. But, you know, that's just the environment we're You know, it's the life we, we live at the moment. And everyone's, for all the programs, have been pretty good. You know, we've had a couple of scares. Guys wake up with a, with a sore throat, go get tested. Everything shuts down. If that test comes back negative, which it has a couple of times, we can then get back into a, a training, you know, so colds and runny noses that, that shuts everything down. And that's just the, the life we all lead, I suppose, at the moment. Yeah. A walk of, uh, whatever work you're in. No, it's, yeah, there's uh, different ways for you guys to train and you're probably with all your coaching experience, this is not something you've probably come across before. So it's, you're probably thinking of different ways to make sure that your guys are staying fresh and active and not getting too bored because there has been no gameplay for them. So, you know, I don't envy the, I don't envy the, the role that you and the other coaches in are of, of the national programs, but uh, so I guess, keep it up, keep those guys uh, ready to go. And uh, I'm hoping as everybody else is at the Olympics are, are, are going to be happening. So, and I, I can't wait to see you guys out there. We're going to jump to our quick fire section now. Um, I call it quickfire. I've had a few people complain that they have to think too long. They want me to rename it, but I just haven't come up with a name yet. So I, I just refer to it as quickfire. So we have about 15 questions here. Some of them are rugby based. Some of them are personality sort of based. Uh, it's, this is just for a little bit of fun. You ready to give it a try? Uh, <laughs> yeah, come on, man. Let's go. All right. Question one, where was your favorite place to play? Central Park. We're good. Okay. Where's your favorite place to coach? Twickenham. Twickenham, nice. All right. Sevens or 15s or league? Oh, league and sevens. <laughs> league and sevens. All right. <laughs> What's the best match you're ever part of? Could be as player, could be as a, as a coach. Best match? Um, wow. The 2003 Challenge Cup? No. 2003, is it 2003? Oh my God. No, 2000, sorry, 2001. Okay. 2001, um, uh, Super League Grand Final. Uh, we beat Wigan, uh, Bradford Wigan. Nice. All right, what's your favorite rugby tradition? Oh, singing. Oh, like, uh, like a first cap song or just singing after a match with a beer? Oh, first cap song sucks. <laughs> Sorry, uh, my language, but that's so nervous against guys you smash and you know tackle and but to sing in front of them when they're taking the mickey out of you that no that really that's a horrible feeling no um just just when you get into uh, after a good win or a, you know a good game uh, in the in the change room a couple of beers and you have a couple of good songs and um, that that's a great tradition in rugby what uh, what's your favorite rugby song then. Uh, Delilah. <laughs> you want to sing a little bit for us? Yeah. My voice, my gravelly voice, it's uh, it turn your, your viewers will turn off. Well, it's, it's part of tradition. If somebody says their favorite tradition is the song aspect, they are by law mandated to sing part of that song. Well, when, when you're out here next time, we'll, uh, we'll have a, we'll a shindig together. Is, look at that sidestep right there. <laughs> All right, what's your, uh, what's your, what's your nickname? A sauce. So, what is it? Sauce. Sauce? Yeah. Like S-A-U-C-E? Yeah, because my initials are HP. 
Aha. All right. Okay. Fair enough. And uh, there's a sauce in the UK called HP sauce. Yeah. Good steak sauce. Yeah. Which, as a coach, which team do you love to dominate? Which team do you love to just to put the hurting on? <laughs> um, every team we feel I coach, like there's not one. I don't, I haven't, I don't have a favorite that, uh, you know, you just, you're, you're, you're thankful if you, you know, come out of it on the on the right side. Uh, there's not one team. I'm, that's that's a good coach answer right there. <laughs> yeah, you know, like don't want anyone to pick this up and go right with you uh, as a coaching weapon against me. No, like you you respect it. Like I, I, for me, I total respect for everyone. Um, if we get if we get the W, great. Okay. Any rugby superstitions? Not really. No. No. Not even as a player. No, uh, I had a couple of, uh, you know, like things I went through, processes uh, that gave me confidence, but there wasn't like I put a left boot on, right boot, uh, say a Hail Mary or something, no. Um, I tried to, you know, try not to have those so that it would, because it would work against you. So, you know, I'd, I'd mix it up in the change room. I'd some days have music, some days not have music. Um, you know, you have your favorite boots and, and you know, favorite maybe socks that you put with your boots underneath but they're more equipment and i if i didn't have that i, I didn't feel like it was you know the end of the world so that i'd feel the stress of it as well it was more mental prep work for you then yeah i tried to just uh take every game pretty relaxed yeah in rugby league it was really different to rugby. this is a small story joined bath uh, me and jason robinson and we're in the the change room at the rec um and the, the changing room in Wigan, and that was my first, uh, second premiership club, but even Wakefield when I first went there, first men's proper premiership uh, sort of feeling in the change room. I'm, I'm surprised, like, guys are walking around half naked, uh, guys are reading magazines, guys are, you know, some are listening to music, some are having a joke and a laugh. But when you went out of the changing room for the warm-up, switched on, come back in, it, the, the atmosphere could be light again. Go back out for the game, cross the white, you know, walk over the white line, man, you're in game mode. Rugby union, changing room, quiet. When I first went to Bath, it was quiet. Everyone was sort of like, the mood was kind of like really, really somber. Um, and I'm kind of like doing my own thing. So sort of me and Jason are talking. And, and then the forwards went into the, the wreck at, at Bath. They went into the, and the, the, the changing room there at that time was really small, it was tiny. I was, really confused and because I forgot it was a council ground they, they, the ground's actually a council ground so they can't make many adjustments to it the Fords went into, into the, this other room side room where the showers and that were and then there was a bang crash smash the, and then the door opened they came out and they were like some of the guys were like hair was ruffled there was I think it was a nosebleed it was like what had just gone on they were obviously <laughs> to want to get themselves ready for their battle me and Jason just looked at each other like they're not and I whispered to like a couple of the bath guys they're not going to do that to us are they I'm like no don't worry that's forwards. <laughs> so that was my first real like I've never really seen that from you know team and then obviously saw that at Gloucester and, and, and in my rugby travels I've seen that they try and get themselves uh, pumped up yeah um, I just never, I, I, you know, for me, it was crossing the white line. It was, you know, I'd, I'd even have a joke with opposition guys, you know, pre-match, doing kicking, you know, you're out there warming up. You know, guys I knew I'd have a laugh with. Guys, Some guys didn't want to do that. They just wanted to stay in their own little zone. Everyone teach to each their own. Um, I, I, I always thought I had a pretty good way of switching on to, you know, we're playing now and, you know, this is your job. So do that and do it well. Um yeah, it was, but that that bath moment really shocked me. Yeah, it would have freaked <laughs> you out a little bit. All right. And I also learned at Gloucester to stay away from the French players. We had a couple of French props and hookers, and I got I got a couple of shots in my arm, smashed, and like HP, you ready? And I'm like, yeah, man, I'm ready. I'm like, <laughs> stay in my stay in my corner, right? Yeah. Stay over there. Where's the physio? Olivia <laughs> Zam and. Patrice Calazzo go at each other. Oh, I'll just stay away. <laughs> All right. It's the fun part. It's the stories. Yeah. I <laughs> you learn once. You learn quickly. I thought I was a pretty quick learner. <laughs> you know who to avoid in pre-match. <laughs> yeah. On your own team. <laughs> That's a new one for me. Who would be three people you would take on an axe-throwing tournament for world domination? 
Have you thrown uh, axes? Yeah, a couple times. Yeah, oh, that's fun. All right, perfect. So, uh, yeah. who's who's your all star team for world domination? For world domination, yeah. uh, Jason Cudmore. <laughs> I've got to throw cuddles now because uh, working with him in this environment, I'm pretty sure he's uh, He'd probably throw chainsaws. Yeah, he'd probably. Yeah. <laughs> he'd probably do two hand at once, yeah. like, showing off. Uh, no, Jamie, um, I'd take my brother. He's pretty, he's got a, a do I, and then and me, right? I'd yeah, and one more. So four, a team of four. A team of four. Um, who else is good in my career? Uh, Inga Tugimala, I love that guy. He looked after me when I was growing up in uh, mm-hmm. Oregon, and, and he, he, he was really skillful at a bunch of things. So I take Inga the winger, uh, my brother, Jamie. Yeah, good crew. That'd be a good crew. What's the most used app on your phone? Uh, what's that? <laughs> Aside from WhatsApp, because that's everybody's answer. <laughs> oh, oh, I love you, my, um, my watch, heart rate. Uh, okay. As, as an older gentleman now, uh, <laughs> Gotta check and make sure you're getting your steps in and not running around as much as I used to. Yeah, like I, I, I know because my dad, uh, my dad's a Mary, you know, Marys, we put on, we put on weight pretty quickly, you know, so I've got to, and my dad got to a big, a big stage in his life, you know, eating too much, not doing enough fitness. Um, I think that could happen to me really quickly. Uh, my dad's now, you know, works, he's working that off and he's trying to stay fit. Um, but that's definitely the, my uh, health app as a, as, a, as a, you know, just curious, you know, how many, how many steps, how many uh, calories I'm um, burning or need to burn. I think that's, a, that's probably a good one to have at our age. I think I'm a little bit older than you. I've got a little bit more gray hair, I think. So <laughs> what is your go-to food? Eggs. Eggs? Just like scrambled? Oh, every, every which way, yeah. Every which way? Poached. Uh, everyone that knows me knows that I love eggs. All right. What's uh, chips or cookies? Chips and crisps. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, crisps, yeah. What is there a particular kind? Uh, I'm not sure if you have them here in Canada. Uh, like prawn cocktail? And no, it was like Walker's, Walker's prawn cocktails. I don't think we have those here. Or New Zealand was definitely rations and twisties. You wouldn't, I don't think you've got them here either, but I think no. you call it twisty like a like a Cheeto or Crunch It or something like that. Yeah. Like yeah. Okay. Uh, rations, you don't you definitely don't have that. Uh, I think they're a New Zealand thing. <laughs> French fries or onion rings? French fries. French fries or poutine? Well, isn't poutine have just you had French fries? Cheese and gravy on it, yeah. That's the that's yeah, the... probably I mean We'd always have chips and gravy back in England. So, yeah, pretty soon, yeah, great. Yep. Uh, what's your favorite beer? Yeah, Foster's. <laughs> Australian beer, really? Oh, come on. <laughs> All right. Wow. What's a guilty pleasure? Chocolate. Chocolate? Chocolate. Okay. Uh, yeah, big chocolate fan. Try and train all the time so I can have as much chocolate as <laughs> Where's the best? I think I know the answer. Where's the best place for a post-match beer? Change room. Change room. Yep. Yeah. I thought that was going to be oh, it. Uh, let me see. What's your favorite song or like your favorite genre of music or something like that? Oh, I'm a massive hip-hop, hip-hop fan when I was growing up as a kid. Hip-hop? Yeah. Right. yeah. Big, big in New Zealand. Uh, I'm a whiskey. I'm from West Auckland. And rap, you know, R&B was, was really popular. So... I grew up in that kind of like naughty by nature, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Uh, yeah. I'm not judging. <laughs> all right. What series oh, are you? I'm all music, eclectic, uh, you know. Uh, now my family's from, uh, my English family, we're from Glast- kind of Glastonbury area, um, Wales and Somerset. So I, I go to the festival a lot and, you know, I can just rock to anything. Eh? Whatever's out there, that's good. Yeah. What series are you binge watching right now? A Lupin. Lupin? What's that about? Uh, a, he's, a, he's kind of like a, he's a, fr- it's a French series. Uh, hold on, you know, until uh, my manager's got me onto it. He's uh, like, I'm only into episode two, but uh, like, I just want to watch the next episode. He's a con- kind of like a con man. He's trying to find out what happens to his father. So people that are into it will know. Uh, That'd be but cool. It's pretty cool, yeah. Is it in French or is it like subtitles or? Yeah, it's in subtitles, it's in French. Yeah. 
Okay. What's your favorite movie? Karate Kid. Oh. His old uh, Karate Kid, The Goonies. Oh, nice. <laughs> Some good era. 80s uh, classics. Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Gremlins. <laughs> things <Nice>. like that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> three, three left here in the quick fire. Who would play you in the Netflix movie of your life? Oh. Ralph Macchio? My wife thinks, um, oh, what's his name? Evans. Um, Luke Evans, that's the guy. Who is this? Luke Evans? Luke Evans, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Who would play the leading lady? Oh, my wife. <laughs> <laughs> that is a safe answer. Yeah. What would the movie be, what would the movie be called? Uh, saving HP. Saving HP. <laughs> All right. So Luke Evans with your wife saving HP. Yeah, so bad. like saving Trevor Ryan, but it's yeah. sort of a war movie. Uh, but I'm the hero and I <laughs> battle against uh <laughs> get this all plotted out. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did literally just to make this up. Uh, awesome sort of like style because I'm a massive Star Wars geek as well. Wizardy, you know, it could be sort of Harry Potter, HP, you know, HP and the the damsel in distress. I don't know what we call it. That's, uh, that's weird. I like that. Harry Potter, but HP can get in there. <laughs> that's good. That's good. All right. Just, Sorry just to geek out on you, man. Sorry? Sorry to be a geek on you. Hey, hey, hey I'm, a, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. All right. Just a couple questions left. All right. So you come from a place where rugby is the alpha sport, both New Zealand and England. It's the dominant sport. Here in Canada, it's different. You get you got hockey, you got basketball, putting a strain will hold on. You got football, you got soccer, baseball, sports for different seasons. What are some things or what are your thoughts with, you know, your worldly experience? What can Rugby Canada do to help promote rugby better so that we get more players at an earlier age um, so that they kind of stick with rugby and have it as a grassroots sport so that when they get to your level, when they get towards, you know, then they're in their 20s, we're, we're in a pretty good place. How do, how do we do that? It's a million dollar question, I suppose, for teams that are on the tier two kind of spectrum, because you're always coming, um, whether it's us here in, in the Americas or in, in Europe, uh, where a lot of countries have football, soccer as their number one sport. Southern Hemisphere, um, we play everything. Uh, we try and do everything. And um, I think we're lucky with our, with our weather conditions that we you know, can play pretty much all year round. Um, why rugby especially down in the Southern Hemisphere, is the premier sport. I'm not, really, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure how it kind of developed that way in New Zealand. Um, but I know they're, they're, they're pretty good at it. Um, I, I think, you know, in terms of logistics, it's easy to get around the UK, football or rugby-wise, you know, soccer or rugby-wise, to, to travel. I know as, you know, playing for up in the north, um, you know, to get to London, it's a couple-hour drive. You know, to get to a camp, it's pretty easy. To get to, to a game is pretty easy. Here, you, you've got you know, you know the logistics of trying to get you know from coast to coast, uh, north south is, is really tricky. Um, I don't know. You know, it's it's one of those things we are working on as a, as an organisation to figure out how we introduce the game to to all levels. I know they you know they've introduced rookie rugby. Um, they they want to get involved in schools, um, universities um, to promote the game. Uh, especially for, I know a lot of our athletes, especially guys in 15s and a bunch of the guys here in 7s, you know, have all played junior hockey, um, all sound like we're all pretty good at it. They just picked up a rugby ball one day and, and, and if, or if they went to the school that was playing rugby, they really love this. They love the sport. So it's one of those sports, like anything, I think you can pick the rugby ball up and go, oh, this thing doesn't bounce the, you know, the, 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 the right way. Or you pick it up and go, oh, yeah, you know, it's contact. I think, I think ice hockey and you know, hockey and, and rugby, you know, they love the contact. So guys that have come from hockey love you know, being able to you know, tackle and get ruck, ruck in and get involved. I don't know, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough question. It's a, it's a really tough question. You know, I, what we can do at, this, at my level right now is promote a really attractive style of rugby to watch. Um, you know, we did our best at Vancouver and with the, the, the report we had with the crowd. And I know they get it every time they've been there, but 
getting deeper into the later challenge rounds, you know, the quarterfinals, the semifinal, lost to Australia, and then winning the bronze medal. You know, we had a lot of people pumped, you know, over those two days to see the team do well at their home tournament. Um, the, the women's have done really well in, you know, in promoting the game and being successful on the World Series and in the Olympics, you know, in Rio. Um, you know, show this a sport that's got, you know, quality and, and you know, um, try and just promote, you know, uh, tons of positives about, you know, what it can do for your health and fitness, um, be diverse um, as much as we can. Um, there's a ton of things we can do uh, to try and introduce people to the game that, that they're trying. Uh, you know, it's difficult times because, you know, the, the organization as, you know, as itself has, has had to, you know, let, let good people go because it's just, you know, they're not the work on at the, at the moment. So, Marketing's gone, re, you know, really thin, and you know those type of things. But hopefully, if, if the world kind of comes out of it, uh, we can recover. Then, then yeah, I think my yeah, my job is to promote. A, you know, I want the guys to play and have fun. Um, sometimes, you know, in the way that we play a style of game that we have to play to be successful, um, we'll have to do some 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 things that are uncomfortable. Uh, we can't just be frivolous with the ball. We have to, you know, maintain continuity. That means sometimes, you know, being direct even, um, which this team, this team has you know, no problem with. We've got some big, strong guys. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in awe of the actual athletes, you know, um, and, and, and across all the sports, you know, look at the basketball and football and, you know, I've been trying to, you know, get my knowledge up on Canadian sports you know, across the board, you know, um, because I grew up in, in New Zealand, been right into American football. You know, Mer New Zealand is very Americanized. So yeah, I mean, we're you know we'll we'll, we'll try our best to grow, and, um, and hopefully this team can um, you know can catch the eye of a of a youngster, and they see what you know a Hiriyama does, and a, a Braid, and a trainer, and you know a Salda. Uh, hopefully, they're they're those are excitement machines, and our team can catch the eye of some 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 interested uh, youngster. Absolutely. Uh, last question. Uh, Major League Rugby, it's in its third or fourth year here. What can that do? What can professionalism in North America do? And have an and how can it have an impact on rugby in Canada? Oh, I should have mentioned the Arrows as well. They, you know, they've got a huge role to play in, in growing the game and making the rugby you know, great concept and great competition. I really enjoyed watching the, the, the last couple of years. Um, obviously, Phil and Phil Mack and Canadian boys down in Seattle just, you know, stamped Canadian rugby, you know, on the map as they have done for a lot of years in, in the Americas because um, there was a ton of guys down there that, you know, and they you know, went back to back with with rings. So, you know, credit to Phil and what they, those guys and the Canadian boys that had to success down there in Seattle. Great having Phil Mack in our, in our environment now as a coach and, uh, you know, I'm learning a ton off of Phil even though he's a young coach, so it's, it's you know it's great to share stuff. He's been involved in our sevens environment because uh, he was a fantastic sevens player himself. Um, MLR hopefully just promotes uh, you know guys to career pathway from maybe MLR into Europe and and uh, and obviously Japan, um, Southern Hemisphere. You know I know um, Taladron was down with the Chiefs and um, Evan Olmstead has been down with Auckland Blues. A bunch of guys, you know, guys in the past that have done kind of like done some um, uh, some rugby down in, you know, uh, what do they call it? Um, Heartland rugby, you know, uh, guys in the past that have been in sort of Northland and Southland to, to, to grow their experiences in some of the, the clubs in New Zealand um, that aren't flashy and uh, it's, it's not, you know, sort of uh, super rugby. But all those super rugby guys came from the Heartland type clubs and learnt their, you know, learnt their graft local in local rugby. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> it was just, <laughs> I was going on the rant. But no, I think MLR is going to play a huge part, uh, and I just fingers crossed that they can you know, survive. Um, the, the, how everything's been sort of reduced and re reduction of games and travel costs because you know it's what. I think the Americas have been crying out for, and I know Southern, you know, down, sorry, down in um, the South America, they've been trying to get their own uh, professional 
uh, league up or semi-pro league up. Um, really want that to succeed because that's just going to grow the game down there and make it more competitive on this side of the you know, this side of the world. And you know, hopefully we can start you know really having to go consistently at Southern Hemisphere and Northern Hemisphere teams. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be. Uh, I, I hope it's uh, it continues to grow and stay strong because I don't think it can do anything but help rugby in Canada, rugby in the U.S. Uh, and this side of the pond. So. Uh, hopefully that's the case. Anyway, listen, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Uh, I learned a lot for sure. And uh, I, I really hope the Olympics stay on and that uh, you guys do well when the sevens events pick back up and uh, medal at the medal at the Olympics. I think that's what we're all hoping for. So thank you very much for your time, Henry. I appreciate it, Jamie. Um, to all the listeners, uh, you know, get out and watch the boys, watch the players, uh, support all of Rugby Canada's teams. You know, uh, I, you know I wish the girls uh, all the best for a delayed uh, World Cup, and uh, it, it, you can you can approach it like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not saying this for the girl. I'm just saying for for everything in life, right? You approach it like, oh, I've got another year to get ready. You now, you know, I, I'm disappointed for them. I know they're all pumped, ready for that. But um, like like us, you know, we've tried to approach it for the sevens with the delay in the Olympics. We've got another year to get ourselves right, and um, let, let's yeah, let's uh, let's everyone out there support your team, support this these players, uh, men and women, hopefully uh, share a song of Delilah on the sidelines. Uh, <laughs> <some point. laughs> well, thanks for your time. I really, really appreciate it. But cheers. Thanks very much, Henry. A lot of good stuff there. Good, some good stories, good, uh, good laughs with HP uh, sauce, I guess we want to call them from now on. <laughs> that was great. Thanks for joining us. I know you got a busy schedule. It took us a long time to get this lined up and, uh, you're right now, you're in the middle of Dubai and uh, you're prepping the sevens men's team to get some matches. And so that's exciting. And uh, we hope and wish you guys nothing but the best as you're over in Dubai playing some games. Uh, really love the passion you have for all things rugby, whether it's union league, sevens, 15s, like whatever, you, you just seem to enjoy it. And I think that enthusiasm and passion is going to be great for the game here in Canada. Coming soon, we've got Rod Snow. He's going to be our next guest. Tom Woods and I are still trying to nail down a date as are Travis Larson and Josh Steele of the San Diego Legion. And then we're still trying to get the, a date lined up. I've been chatting with Brett Bukaboom and Evan Olmstead trying to get a date lined up with that group pod with Matt Evans and Matt Bukaboom. We've had a couple of dates that looked good, but then they fell through last minute, but it's still happening. And uh, so that's great. So we've got a lot on tap and uh, make sure that you always reach out if you have anybody else that you want me to try and get on. As always, gonna say thank you to the listeners because it's you that want to hear these great stories of all these great rugby people in Canada. So make sure that you keep spreading the news, spread the good rugby word of rugby in Canada. As always, got to say thanks to my son, Ryland, for creating our intro and outro music. Uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of fun having him help me with this. As always, as I said, feel free to request not just guests, but maybe you have specific questions. You know who's coming up. Maybe there's a question that you've always wanted to ask Tom Woods or a question you want to ask Evan Olmstead. Just fire me an email or send it to me on social media. Lastly, this is Jamie, and until next time, I want you to stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane, and most importantly, keep on rocking.